Psalm 22. <clears throat> and while this is a great psalm about uh, Jesus Christ and his crucifixion and his suffering, that's not the thought that I want to take out of this psalm. Look at Psalm 22, verse 10. Psalm 22, verse 10. The Bible says, <clears throat> I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. The title for the sermon tonight is From My Mother's Belly belly okay so we're going through this series on the family last week i preached about wives you know how wives you know according to the bible how they ought to behave toward their husbands the kinds of roles and responsibilities that ladies have as wives now this is the time that i would have covered on fathers you know uh fa you know fathers how to be you know a godly father but we had the preaching uh, you know on father's day about being a father so we're going straight into preaching about a mother, okay? So we're looking at all the different aspects of a family, okay? I know a family is straightforward, but we have how a man ought to behave, how a husband ought to be. We have how he ought to be as a father. We have how our lady ought to behave herself as a wife. And she also has the responsibility as a mother. Later on, we'll be looking at children. We'll be looking at educating the children, disciplining the children, all these kinds of things. And I'm going to end the series later on with a broken home. You know, what happens if you're someone from a broken home situation? But right now we're focusing on the mother. And notice there in verse number 10, it says, I was cast upon thee from the womb. And then these words are said to God, Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Now this is the word of God. The word of God tells us that as soon as a child is born, they have the capacity of making the God of the Bible their God. Their God. And here we have a church of, of Christian people, of, of godly families. And what I want to encourage you and make you think about is the fact that if you are a mother, if you are a pregnant lady, that that baby in your womb can make God, the God of the Bible, their God from the very beginning. You see, when you come to church and we sing the praises and the hymns of God, that little baby in the womb hears those praises. You know, when you're praying together as a church, as a family, you know, when you speak out loud, when you, when you read the Bible out loud, that little baby child can hear what is being said. And so we had the psalmist acknowledging, look, even when I was in the womb, and from the time I came out of the womb, you know, I already had, I already had the God of the Bible as, as my God. As my God. And... Uh, I'll just turn that off, sorry. And so I want you to think about, you know, what is it that you surround yourself with when you become a mother? You know, are you playing the world's rock music? But, you know, whatever you entertain yourself with, whatever you do as a mother, as that child grows in the womb, it's hearing what you're hearing. Okay, that little baby might be hearing that worldly music. The, the child might be hearing inappropriate things, worldly things. You know, is your heart's desire for that child to have the God of the Bible as their God from, from birth? Or would you rather that child be surrounded and influenced by the world? You know, you have already, before that baby is born, you can actually influence that child, you know, where its heart is. And it reminds me of, uh, it reminds me of, um, of Moses. Moses as a little child, you know, was only there with the mother for a few little years. And then he was given over to Pharaoh's daughter. But when, 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 when uh, Moses grew up, he recognized, no, he's of the children of Israel. And his God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he was able to leave Egypt. He was able to leave the world system and go after the God of his people and suffer affliction with his people. And he only had a few short years with his mother until he was weaned from the mother's breast. Then he was given over to Pharaoh's daughter. Okay, now I want the first thing I want you to think about, you know, our mothers, you know, your children, your children ought to be very precious to you. The Bible says that they are a reward from God. And again, this is contrary to the world. The world tells us that children are burdens. The world will tell you that children are expensive. You know, I, I'm thankful that I was able to get the mortgage for my house. But you know, when I tried to refinance, when, 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 you know, the, the, I meet the, the, the mortgage broker and they're like, yeah, don't worry, we'll be e easy, be able to, you know, get you, uh, you know, a better deal, these kinds of things. And they find out, how many kids have you got? Or eight kids? Oh, man, the system says you can't afford it. All right. We, we can't refinance you because you're not supposed to be able to afford this, you know, because everyone thinks having children is expensive. Everyone thinks that having children is a burden. Okay. Now, children is work. Okay. But just because it's work, it doesn't mean it's a bad thing. 
We all do work, we all, we're all productive, and when we work with our heart, hands and we're productive, that's a pleasing thing. That's, a, that's, a, that's something that brings satisfaction and joy in our lives. You guys are in Psalms, go to Psalm 22. Actually, look at, look at verse number 9. Look at verse number 9. You're already in Psalm 22. Look at verse number 9. It says here, But thou art he that took me out of the womb, thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breasts. So what I want you to notice there. Uh, is that, you know, the Lord God's eye is on that child in that womb. In that womb, you know, God already counts that as a little child. And what happens, what's, what's, what's being debated here in New South Wales Parliament is again, the, you know, abortion. You know, what, what are the rules and requirements to abort that little child? You know, God's eye is on that little child, you know. And, and we, we live in a society that's seeking to destroy the little children. No different to the time of Moses. When Egypt was trying to destroy the children of Israel, you know, they would cast them into, into the river. And you know what? Our governments, they're trying to destroy these little babies, these little children in the mother's womb. But we see here that God's eyes upon the child, um, even in the womb of the mother. Go to Psalm 127, please. Psalm 127, verse 3. Psalm 127, verse 3. The Bible tells us in Psalm 127 verse 3, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is His reward. reward. You know, mothers, if you've been rewarded, if you've had the fruit of the womb, the Bible says that was God's reward to you. All right, that's a reward. It says here, children are an heritage of the Lord. The word heritage comes from inheritance. Okay, it's in, God says, look, as my child, as my daughter, someone that's saved, when I give you a child, this is your inheritance. This is a reward for being a child of God. I hope that's, your, that's in your hearts, mothers. You know, when you have that child, uh, that you look at that as a reward from God. It means the God of the universe has looked down upon you and said, you know what, I'm going to reward this woman. You know, she's, she's been living after my way. She's, you know, she's a godly woman. She's married. You know, I'm going to give them the reward of a child. That's how we ought to think about children, okay? Now, please go to Psalm 139. Psalm 139. I'll get you to turn here just because you're in Psalms. Go to Psalm 139, verse 12. Because, you know, uh, you know the, the scientists the, the, you know, the, are telling us that when that child is in the womb of the mother, they just call it a fetus. You know, it's just a bunch of tissues, a bunch of cells. You know, there's no reason why we can't destroy it. But look here, it actually talks about the child being developed in the womb of the mother in Psalm 139 verse 12. It says, Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. Now, you'll soon see this is talking about the womb. As the child is in the womb of the mother, it's in darkness. Okay? But God can see that child even in the darkness. Look at verse number 13. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. Look at this. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. You know that little child that grows in the womb of the mother? The Bible tells us it's fearfully and wonderfully made. You know, you've been fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God, in the sight of God, He has created you. It's a miracle. You know, the scientific world, they don't understand how it works. They don't know how, how a child, you know, grows. I mean, they'll, they'll give you the scientific explanations, but they don't understand how the cells multiply. They don't understand how, how uh, the DNA structure is, is, is uh, you know, uh, tells, you know, the cells to grow an arm and to grow a face and to grow legs and all those kinds of things. It doesn't have all that information, let alone the information of the child's soul and the child's spirit, which science can't even, you know, can't even comprehend. You know, let's keep reading there. Verse number 15. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. Look, this child is still developing. You know, it's not perfect. And it says, look, the eyes of God can see that substance of that human being. And in thy book, all my members were written which in continuous, continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. So you can see this, these beautiful words of a child developing in the womb of a mother. You know, why does our society seek to destroy this little child? 
And it's such a sad thing. It's a sad thing when Christians are killing their own children. Maybe out of negligence or ignorance. You know, whatever it is, it's still a destruction. It's still the murder of a little child. Okay? The Bible tells us that the child is a reward from God. Okay? Please go to Psalm 113. Psalm 113 verse 9. Psalm 113 verse 9. Motherhood is difficult. Motherhood requires work. Right? It is difficult. It does require work. You know? But look what the Bible says here in Psalm 113 verse 9. He maketh the barren woman to keep house. The Bible tells us that if you're someone who is barren, that God is able and has the ability to make you keep the house. Meaning that there are many barren women, many barren women are found in the Bible. And yet God was able to give them children. They were able to keep the house. And then it says this, And to be a joyful mother of the children, of children. Praise ye the Lord. To, to what? To be a, a what mother of children? To be a, a stressed mother of children? Is that what it says? To be a burdened mother of children? Is that what it says? No, to be a joyful mother of children. And, and mothers, what I'm seeking for you, the challenge that I want to give you today is, yes, you have children, but are you a joyful mother of children? Or are you a uh, stressed, burdened, you know, heavy, heavily weighed down and, and sorrowful, full of children? No, the Bible says, look, children will give you joy. Children will give you joy. One thing that I had to learn in my life, and I don't know if I covered this already in my previous sermons, I got to a point where, you know, I, I, I was, uh, you know, married. You know, I, was, I was working a job. I had my friends. You know, we had a couple of kids. And I realized in my life that I couldn't spend the time that I would have liked with my friends. I couldn't do all the activities that I used to do before I was married. And I remember just being kind of cast down about it. And, and I realized, I got to a point where I realized, why am I cast down? You know, I've got everything I need. I've got a job I can provide for my family. I've got a wife. I've got a kids. You know, according to the Bible, this is the best thing that I can possibly have. What I realized, I just had to change my mindset. I had to find a joy in my family. I had to find joy in my children. And then it's like a, flip, a, a switch. Just, just like this, this, this switch of maturity. Just, and I'm like, man, I'm a father. I'm married. I've got kids. You know, and I started to find joy in that. I was rejoicing in the fact that I could come home and spend time with my kids. And the desire to be with my friends and doing all those other activities started to just dwindle away. You know, I, I, don't, I was like, it's just like overnight, literally, this switch just happened because I had to make a conscious decision to find joy in my family, to find joy in my children. And I would say it's probably no different to a mother who is struggling with children, a mother who is cast down and sorrowful. You've got to find the joy in your children. Just make that conscious decision. God's given me kids. God says I can find joy in this family. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to find joy in my family. And I reckon you're going to have that switch flicked and you'll be right where God wants you to be in His will. All right. Now, we've looked at the... Uh, I won't get to turn there, but we looked last week at the um, virtuous woman. And I'll just read a couple of passages to you. The Bible says in Proverbs 31.10, Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. And we noticed this before. It said, The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. My first point that I brought up, guys, that I was speaking about before, is that children are a reward from God. That's point number one, that children are a reward from God. But point number two is that your husband has entrusted you with the children. Your husband has entrusted you with the children okay now in a typical family husbands are out there trying to you know make a dollar they're out there trying to work a job to provide the needs for the family to pay for the mortgage to pay for the bills these kinds of things and the idea behind that is that the wife would be trusting her husband to do those things that she doesn't have to worry about you know, uh, are, are we going to be taken care of for? You know, I don't have to worry about are the bills going to get paid? You know, is the mortgage or whatever, the rent, is that going to be paid? You know, we don't want our wives to worry about those things. You know, we want the wives to have trust of their husbands to take care of that business. Well, in reverse, because the husbands typically are at work, in, in reverse, the husband then wants to be able to entrust his wife with the children that God has given them. Okay? You know, husbands at work, they don't want to have to be stressed and worried. You know, are the kids okay? Who's looking after the kids? Where are the kids? No, it'd be better if they knew they're home with the homemaker, with the one that guides the house, with 
the wife, with the mother of the kids. Your husband has trusted you to look after those children. Okay? And you don't want to betray that trust. Okay? Don't betray the trust because there are husbands that come home and they come home to a rotten house. They come home to a rebellious wife. They come home to disobedient children. And you know, whether they realize that or not, it starts to create tensions. It creates strain in the marriage. Okay? One reason why marriages fall apart is they just can't trust one another. The wife can't trust the husband. The husband can't trust the wife. They come home. The family's falling apart. The kids are all over the place. You know, there's disobedience. There's rebellion. You know, the husband would rather just get out of that place. They don't want to be in that home. You know, I thank God that I have a godly wife. And I remember going to work, coming home was the best part of my life later on. I started to enjoy just being home, being with my wife, being with my family, playing with the children. You know, and that helped my marriage because I was coming to a place that I was enjoying. Okay? And, and wives, you know, typically you're at home. You know, according to the Bible, you're the homemaker, you're the mother. You need to make that environment in the house the best possible environment you can. You know, your husband will come home tired, stressed, frustrated at some co-worker, maybe a bit frustrated, whatever. He wants to be able to come home and, and just, just relax, you know, spend that time, the quality time with his family. You know, otherwise, that can create marriage problems, marriage tensions when people aren't look, aren't, uh, don't have the full trust within one another. And so, you know, uh, um, that's point number two, that your husband has entrusted you with your children. I don't have much more to say on that point. But I do have a third point that I want to talk about here. And this is the third point, mothers, that you need to understand with your children. The third point here is that you are a mother first of all. That you are a mother first of all. You're not a teacher first of all. You're not a friend first of all. You're a mother first of all. Okay, you're a mother first of all. Please go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. You are a mother, first of all. One mistake that I see with mothers, or certain mothers, is that they strive to be a friend, first of all. Okay? A friend to their children, rather than a mother. Now, when we talk about a mother, a mother is someone that is there to nurture the children. Okay? But the second thing is, a mother has authority over the children. Have you ever seen kids where they actually seem like they have the authority over the mother? Are you familiar with those situations where the kids seem to be running the mother around, you know, left, right and centre? You know, the, the mother's taking them to, to, to that friend's house, the mother's taking them to that activity, and it's basically the kids seem to be running the place. That happens because the mother has decided to be a friend to their children. I don't want to upset my kids, I don't want to make them frustrated, so I'm going to try to be a friend. I'm going to try to be on their side. Now it's good to be a friend to your children. I'd encourage you, try to be a friend, but not at the expense of being the mother. The mother comes first. Being a mother comes first. You have authority. You need to put your foot down. You know, your kids need to be there to help out the family, not you running around trying to sort out your kids' issues. Okay? You need to put your foot down, mothers, be the mother first, have the authority first, and once that's done, yeah, now it's time to be the friend. Now it's time to do those things because you've put the other priority first. But look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 14. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 14. The Bible says, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Now notice this. So the Bible tells us that it's, it's just easier for women to be deceived. Okay? Now look at verse 15. How is it that we overcome this obstacle? Okay? Verse number 15. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing. What is the Bible saying here? You know, is, you know, is this ladies that come up you know, and say, you know, if ladies come up and say, what must I do to be saved? Say, well, you've got to get pregnant and have children. Is that what the Bible's saying? No, no, no. The Bible, when, it says, it says that we look, when the Bible uses the word saved, it's not always about the soul. Okay, the salvation of the soul. Here, she's being saved from being deceived. Okay, the previous verse just mentioned she's easier to be deceived. How is she saved from being deceived? In childbearing. You see, getting married, having children will give you stability in your life. It's going to prevent the devil from being able to come to you and attack you and deceive you and, and, and walk in after his ways. You know, motherhood is such an important element to a lady's life. 
It's going to help her to overcome the deceiver. Okay, and look, how is it that she ought to raise her children? Look at verse number 15. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing. It's not just having children. It says here, if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. You see, a lot of women have kids. You know, I mean, believers, non-believers, single mothers even, which is wrong. But, you know, they're, they're, they're having children. You say, well, why are they still deceived? Because it's not just having children. It's how you raise your children that matters. That's the hardest bit. The easiest part is having children. Okay? But then you've got to spend the next 20 some years raising that child to know the Lord, to walk after His ways. So let's break this down here because this is so important for mothers to realize. If you've got children, praise God, but how are you going to raise your children? Verse 15 breaks it down for you. In faith, charity, holiness with sobriety. So let's look at faith first, first and foremost. Go to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. Did I give you guys a bad reference last time? Did I say 2 Timothy last time instead of 1 Timothy? Yeah, sorry guys. If you want the reference, it was 1 Timothy 2.14. I realize my mistake now. But 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. The Bible says here, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve for my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. So the, the book of Timothy is a letter that's written from Paul the Apostle to Timothy. Timothy was, an, uh, was a pastor, a young pastor. And here Paul is encouraging Timothy. And look at verse number 5. This is what he says about Timothy. He says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee. He says, Timothy, you've got a faith and it's unfeigned. What does it mean to feign something? It means it's fake. Okay, but when it's unfeigned, it means it's true. He says, Timothy, you've got a true faith. It's a real faith that I see you in, see in you, Timothy. And then look at this. Which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. How was Timothy such a man of faith? How was he such a great man of God according to the Apostle Paul? What is it in Paul? Well, like, what is that Paul recognizes here? He goes, that same faith that I see in you, Timothy, that was, I saw that first in your grandmother. And then I saw it in your mother. And your mother's now passed that faith on to you. What a, what a great thing. What a great thing. Now, I have no idea whether Timothy's mother thought that one day Timothy is going to be this great man. You know, probably didn't think that he ever become a pastor or that he'd be brought, mentioned in the scriptures. But you know what? She put her effort in. She was a godly mother, taught him how to be in the faith taught him about Jesus Christ, you know, taught him the scriptures, and he was able to grow up and do great works of God because of what his mother taught him. His mother taught him how to be in the faith. And, you know, of course, we talk about faith when it comes to salvation, you know, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, salvation by grace through faith. But our whole Christian life is about walking in faith. Our whole Christian life ought to be, you know, walking in the ways of faith. You know, anything that we see in the Bible, you know, say, Lord, you know, I'm not up to your standard, I'm going to walk after your ways. That's you placing faith in the commandments of God. That's you making sure steps of walking in faith. And this can come from a mother. And mothers, please keep this in mind. Again, if you're a traditional family, you know, dads tend to be at work for eight, nine, ten hours, maybe more sometimes, okay, every day. Who's going to have the most time with the children? Mothers. Mothers, you have the ability, you have more time to instill great faith into your children, into your daughters and into your sons. Make sure you pass down your faith to your children. You know, I've seen, and I'm sure we can all relate to this. If you've been in church for a long time, many years, I've seen pastors and pastor wives with great faith. But then the children, no faith. Or in the world, destroying their lives. You know, and, and these pastors have spent all the time, you know, thinking about their church thinking about the families in the church, but forgot to pass down the faith to their children. 
and then the children are running wild. I mean, how many pastor kids do you know that are just don't care about church, don't care about the Lord, because the you know, father and mother spent more time with the families in the church than they did with bringing, making sure their children were walking in faith. So please uh, be careful about that. And, uh, you know, the Bible also tells us, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know how many of you guys um, homeschool. You know, I know some of your, fa- your families homeschool your kids. Uh, some of you don't. You know, I would say, you know, I plan to preach a sermon on homeschooling. I would really recommend it. I would really recommend, you know, I mean, the schools are just getting worse. I remember how bad schools were in my time. They're 10 times worse now. You know, I would never put my kids in a school, you know, cr- even a Christian school. Okay, I mean, I, I, won't even, I won't go into it now, but I will preach a sermon on, on homeschooling. But one thing that I want you to think about, and, and um, you know, even if you put your kids into a public school system, I just want you to think about this verse. Don't turn there, just, just listen to me as I read it. It's Proverbs 1 verse 7. It says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. You see, mothers, your job is to make sure your kids get educated. They grow in knowledge. They don't remain ignorant. You know, but what's the best way for them to learn? The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You want your kids to grow in knowledge? Well, you need to instill in them the fear of God first. That's how they're going to learn. That's how they're going to be educated. If they fear God first and then they're being tempted to sin, they're being tempted to take drugs or to fornicate or all these kinds of things, you know what's going to cross their minds before they do it? Oh man, what if, what's God going to say if they have the right fear of God? What does God have to say about this situation? And that's going to be able to help them to overcome that temptation, walk in faith according to God's ways. Mothers, you have a great chance to influence your children. You know, you, you may not realize this, you know, maybe some of you got saved later in your life, but your children can be saved young. They can, they can be saved at an early age. They can do great works for God earlier than what you did. They can mature and grow in the Lord, you know, quicker than what you've been able to do because you've been saved later in life. Well, praise God. That means they have the opportunity to get out there and get a whole bunch of people saved before you even got one person saved. You know, they have the opportunity to read the Bible cover to cover, you know, know the words of God better than what you were able to know. That's a great thing. It's a great desire if you're seeking for your children to know the ways of the Lord. You know, about, I want my kids to do more for the Lord than what I've been able to do. Amen. And I hope that's in your heart as well. So faith, we saw how we need to make sure that we teach our children, you know, faith, but we need to make sure they inst- have the fear of the Lord instilled in them. If they don't have that fear, how are they going to learn? How are they going to grow in knowledge and wisdom? The next thing that was mentioned was charity. Charity. And um, if you guys can go to... Um, no, I'll just read it to you. I'm going to read to you from 1 Corinthians 8.1. 1 Corinthians 8.1, because it's important for our children to grow in knowledge. That is true. But then it says here that knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Okay, we need to keep this in mind. Uh, we need to be Christians that grow in knowledge, but we need to be Christians that are able to show charity. And the word charity is basically the word love. Okay, it's similar to the word love. That's not just the feelings of love. You know, when you give to a charity, you know, if there's a charity and you give to the charity, what's the idea behind that? If I give to this charity, they'll do something good to those in need, whatever, whatever that need is. That's the idea. Okay? So charity isn't just feeling love. You know, charity is doing something out of love. You know, showing it on the outside, actually doing something. You know, not just telling your wife, I love you, but taking her out and showing her that you love her. You know, buying her the little gifts or whatever it is that she needs. You know, we need to teach our children to have charity. And, uh, you know, this is, you know, love, kindness, you know, self, you know being self-sacrificial toward others. This is the, um, and look, if God's only given you one child, that's the way God's done it for whatever purpose. But one of the advantages of, of having multiple children is that your children learn how to share. Your children learn how to sacrifice a little bit, you know, for the siblings. Because one dynamics that, you know, you've got to get used to when you become a mother is not only is it just now one child, you might have two, and now there's a dynamic between those two children, or three or four or five or etc. You know, and uh, these children, you know, this is one of, the, one of the ways they can learn how to be self-sacrificing, is now they have to share the time with the other siblings. You know, it, I, you know, it's not just me coming to mom and dad all the time. I realize there are other people in the family that needs mom's and dad's attention. And you know what? When you have a bunch of kids, you're going to start using your older children to help you out with the younger ones. And the older children are now learning how to give of themselves, how to show charity, how to show love toward the siblings. 
You know, one thing that my, one of my, my older kids do, um, they get a bit of pocket money at the end of the week, right? And, and we're teaching them how to tithe on, on the pocket money they give toward the church. And uh, the younger children, they don't get any pocket money. And, and I, I love it when, when, they've, when, when they're able to realize, oh, you know what, I, I've saved up quite a bit. My younger siblings, siblings don't have any money. You know what, I'm going to take them to the shop and buy them a little lolly or something. You know, I'm going to go, I don't like them going lolly crazy because it ruins their teeth and bad for their health. But every now and again, you know, they'll go out and they'll buy their little siblings a little toy or a little chocolate. Hey, that's, that's, that's good things for them to learn. Okay, because they've been able to have those siblings. They've been able to grow in knowledge and grow in charity. Okay, that's one of the advantages of multiple children is they can learn how to love one another and they can practice that at home when, when, and when they're, not, when they're not charitable, parents, you come down, you, you fix that up because what you want is to, ra to raise godly men and women that can go out into society and be, you know, and have that good report, have that good reputation in the world. You know, be a strong employee, be a godly mother, be a, be a manly man. These are the kinds of th the children that we want to raise, you know, children that stand Stand out in the community that are a salt and a light to this earth, you know, for Jesus Christ. The next thing that was mentioned there about how we ought to raise our kids was holiness. Holiness, you know, how, you know raising our children, uh, to, you know, making them holy. And the word holiness does not mean perfect. Some people think that. Um, you know, there are a lot of things that we, we attribute that word holy to, you know, the Holy Spirit or the Holy Bible. Um, what, else, what else do we use the word holy with? Uh, of course, when it comes to the Bible, when it comes to attributes of God, of course, that's perfect. But holiness means separation. It's kind of like the word sanctified, something that's been separated, sanctified or made holy. OK, here's the thing, mothers, you need to teach your children to be holy, to be holy. Say, so what does that mean? It means they cannot be like the world. They cannot be walking after the ways of Satan. They need to stand out. They need to be set apart from the rest of the world. They need to be able to stand on the word of God and walk after the ways of God. Set them apart. Make them holy from the rest of the world. Be careful about who your children listen to on the radio. Be careful who your children idolize. You know, I remember when I went to school, you know, I did, I'm going to show you my age right now. But, you know, the, the girls love the Backstreet Boys. You remember, what's his name? Nick? Does anyone know? Nick Carter. All right, there. there's one worldly. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know, but, you know, they, they'd put like posters in, in their bedrooms. They'd come to school and they'd laminate their school books with Backstreet Boys or whatever, you know. And it's like, that's idolizing the world. That's not holiness. I went to a Christian school. I had more worldliness in my Christian school than I did in the worldly school. At least in the worldly school, I knew they were worldly. I knew they didn't love God. Who cares? I expect that, but I expect better in the Christian school. I thought... That was my expectation that I was going to get better people that I could be friends with, but they were still worldly. We need to make sure that our children grow up not idolizing this, the world. You know, I, I love soccer, you know, and I, I see some great players, Ronaldo and, and Messi. But you know what? I don't want my children to grow up idolizing these players because they're probably fornicators. They're probably sleeping around with a bunch of women, probably taking all these kinds of drugs. They're probably the worst example that you can get as a human being. They can be good at the ball, great, but, you know, the rest of their life, they're probably on their way to hell. Why would I want my kids to be idolizing worldly people, you know, worldly celebrities, these kinds of things? Be careful. And also the clothes your children wear, you know, what's on their clothing? A lot, a lot of, um, you know, these uh, superheroes are really popular these days, you know, Spider-Man and Batman and all these kinds of things. You know, I grew up as a child reading these comics. I know all about all these characters. It's amazing that it's all in movies and, you know, these days. You know, and sometimes kids, you know, they come to church or they, you know, or they're amongst other Christians and they're wearing their Spider-Man shirts. And, you know, look, these characters, you know, they're, they're basically uh, like, what's the, they're kind of like God-men. You know, Superman is basically kind of like Jesus Christ. You know, he's come to the world. He saves the, the earth. You know, there's a story of him dying and being resurrected. A lot of these stories with these superheroes are basically just stories from the Bible and then taken to, for, for kids to really, you know, idolize and enjoy these superheroes. You know, be careful of the people, the movies that your children watch. What are they watching? How are they dressing? You know, what are they portraying? Are they holy? Could, you, could people look at your child and say, wow, that child's different. They're not worldly. You know, that child, they can sit still in church. Wow, what an amazing thing. Uh, you, you, I, I can't even remember how many times I've been told people come to our church here or in, in Queensland and it's like, wow, how do the kids sit still so long listening to some man talk about the Bible? 
Hey, that's been separated. That's been holy. Because they don't expect that from the world's children. And mothers, you need to train your children to be holy. Please be careful how they get entertained. You know, and I know it's tempting as a mother. You get busy. There's a lot to do. I'll just stick my kids in front of the TV. Now, look, I think the TV can be used for good purposes. I think you can find some good shows. But many times, mothers don't pay attention. They'll put on the Wiggles or whatever ABC for kids or whatever there is. You know, and, and look, there's a message behind all of this. There's, there's, a, there's a message of the devil behind all these, these things. You've got to be careful what they listen to. It's going to affect their minds. Yep. You know, some, some mothers will, you know, uh, do see the dangers of, of the public school system. And so they homeschool their kids, they'll bring them home, but then they'll stick them in front of the TV or YouTube these days. But there's just the same message, the same problems with a lot of these shows. Make sure you raise your children to be holy, to live holy lives, to live separated lives, okay? You know, don't, you know, don't allow your kids to be raised by video games. Uh, somebody, uh, look, again, video games, it's not always bad. Again, it could be a good tool, but video games these days, you know, in, in my days, you could play a game and you'd finish it. You'd start the game and you would finish the game. You know, or, or you play like a soccer game or something, <laughs> like once the full time's over, the game's finished. Games these days, you can play it non-stop, 24-7. You know, the whole point is to get your kids addicted to it. You know, they'll stay up at night, all night long, playing those games, and then their brains are being melted. You know, they're in reality, and, and their minds are still thinking of the game. I, I've seen children, where you talk to them, and you know in their brains, they're playing some video game. They're thinking about some video game. They're so addicted to the stupid thing. That's not holiness. That's a wholeness. I, I don't know what, I mean, people have worked out how to get people addicted, you know, and, and it costs a lot of money, it costs a lot of time, they get, re, they get, you know, points in their system, but no one cares. That's not going to, that's not going to pay your bills. That's not going to help you find a wife. No woman's going to be impressed by your high score, you know. <laughs> you know, holy living, we need to make sure our children grow up to live holy lives. And the final thing that we had there was sobriety. Sobriety. Now, the word sober or sobriety means serious. Serious. And um, if you guys can go to Proverbs 31, please. And again, we're going to look at the virtuous woman there. Proverbs 31. Seriousness. Now, our children, they're going to grow up to be adults one day. Okay. And uh, I, I'm not against children being children. I let my kids play and have fun and enjoy time with the siblings because they're going to grow up one day. You know, I've, I've got a brother in the United States. You know, he's seven years older than me. You know, uh, when we became adults, he got married. We didn't get to spend a lot of time together as adults. And, but I can look back, you know, in my memories and, and have, you know, remember the good times, the, the laughs, the, the time we got to spend together. I can look back and enjoy that. I, I want my kids to do the same thing. I want them to enjoy life right now. Play, have fun, bring, you know, develop good memories because one day those kids are going to grow up. You know, they might be in other places of the world. You know, I don't know. They may go to other places and never see each other again. Okay. So I want them to enjoy being children right now. But at the same time, we are to raise our children to be sober, to be serious, to know, look, life is not just fun and games all the time. There comes a time when you're going to be an adult and you're developing, you're being trained to be an adult during this time. Proverbs 31 verse 1. Kids need to know that it's not just, you know, lollies, video games and playtime all the time. Proverbs 31 verse 1, the Bible says, The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. Here we have, you know, um, Mother Bathsheba. You know, Bathsheba was the one who committed adultery with King David. And, you know, this is now, uh, you know, King Solomon. Lemuel is a nickname to King Solomon. And even though she made some mistakes in her life, like committing adultery, and by her mistakes, her husband eventually was killed, she was still able to pass down some words of wisdom to her son Solomon later in her life. And these get captured to us by the Bible. But what is it that she wants King Solomon to know? There's, there are two key things that we see in Proverbs 31 that she wants her son to know and that she taught him. Verse number two, what my son and what the son of my womb and what the son of my vows. Now this is what she says. Verse number three, give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. There are two things that um, uh, um, 
uh, Bathsheba taught Solomon here. Number one is not to give your strength unto women. Mothers, you need to teach your boys how to find a good wife. What are the qualities that this woman needs to have that you need to be looking for when it comes to a woman? You know, and not to be a fornicator, not to get out there and destroy your life. Look, it says that it's going to destroy kings. You know, don't give your strength to women. No, find that one wife, that one godly wife, which we later see is that virtuous woman. And this is the instruction that she gives to Solomon. That's not the only instruction that she gives to Solomon. She also teaches him the danger of drinking alcohol. Okay, the danger of getting drunk, these kinds of things. Look at verse number four. Verse number four. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Look at this, verse number six. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish and wine unto those that, are, that be of heavy hearts. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. Open thy mouth for the dumb in the cause of all such as are appointed to destruction. Open thy mouth, judge righteously and plead the cause of the poor and needy. You see, uh, Solomon's mother taught him two things. Number one, find a virtuous woman. You know, don't get around there and, and fornicate and waste your life and destroy your life. Number two, don't drink alcohol. Don't get to a point where you become drunk and you forget the law of God. Because he's in a position of being a king. He's in a position of authority. He has to make judgments. And when he's intoxicated, if he gets intoxicated with alcohol, he's not going to be able to judge righteously. You know, and, and mothers, you know, this is the example we see of this woman. And, and, and you know, I'm, again, you know, I don't say these things to boast, but I'm thankful for my mother. Because I, I don't know if my mom even read this in Proverbs 31. But these are the two things she drives home to me all the time. You know, Kevin, make sure you marry a godly woman. You know, a saved woman. Number two, don't drink alcohol. Right? Because she had an auntie who became an alcoholic and destroyed her life. And she was worried, you know, please don't do this. Don't destroy your life. And I look at Proverbs 31 and go, well, that's my mom. My mom you know, these, are, these are the words of my mom. Hey, but these are the words of advice of every mother. Every mother should be instructing her children, especially her sons, to make sure they know how to treat a woman. They know how to look after a woman and how to find a godly woman and not to destroy their lives with alcohol and drugs and these kinds of addictive substances. Being sober, sobriety. This is what I'm talking about. Seriousness, okay? Life, life is not just games. Let them enjoy life right now, yes. But make sure they understand that life is serious. Okay, it's not a bed of roses. All of us adults, we know we've gone through trials and difficulties. You know, we want our children to come out. You know, they're going to go through those same, the same trials and difficulties that we've gone through. Our children are going to go through similar things. We need to make sure we prepare them for the seriousness of life. Okay. Uh, the last point that I have, let me just repeat the three points that I had of motherhood. Point number one was children are a reward from God. Point number two is that your husband has entrusted you with the children. Point number three, that you are a mother first of all, first of all. And point number four that I have here is don't become envious of other mothers. Mothers, mothers, don't become envious of other mothers. Please go to Galatians chapter five. Galatians chapter five. <clears throat> Galatians chapter five, verse 19. Galatians 5.19, the Bible says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest. Now before we read the rest of it, do you think we're going to have a list of good things or bad things? Bad things, right? It says here, now the works of the flesh. Okay, the flesh is that sinful nature that we have, is manifest. What are these, what are these things? Which are these? Adultery, fornication, man, we started bad already, right? Pretty bad. Uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, man, pretty bad things that are listed here, hatred, variance, emulations. Now I want to pause there with emulations, emulations. What does it mean to emulate, emulate? To emulate is basically to copy, okay, to copy. And, uh, you know, one thing that I, I really encourage um, mothers to think about is, you know, God's given you wisdom, God's given you authority, you know, God's given you a husband, and God's given you a family. And you know what? There's no family on this earth that's just like your family. Just understand that. There is no family on this earth, there's no family in this church that's just like your family. 
Okay? You might have a husband that works different hours to your husband. Okay? Comes home at different times, whatever. Has a different personality to other husbands that are there in the churches. You might have, you know, some families have six kids. Some families have three kids. Some families have one kid. Okay? So the makeup of your family is very different. And if you've got a bunch of kids, you know as well as I do that they're all so different. You know, I've got a set of twins. I would have thought if any kids are similar, it would have been the twins. They're completely opposites. Okay? They like different foods. They like to play different things. They even look totally different. Okay? I mean, children are all different. Your family is unique and special and God has entrusted you into your hands. Okay? What I'm trying to say to you is that you cannot look at another family or another woman, another mother and say, Oh, I'm going to emulate what they do. I'm going to take, and you think, because we get this idea, especially in social media. You know, people on Facebook, they only post the happy pictures. I only post the happy pictures. I'm not going to post when I'm frustrated, right, and upset. I'm going to post when I'm smiling with the kids. <laughs> That's what's going to, and then you get this impression, man, everyone's life is so happy. Everyone's full of joy, and I'm, I'm struggling. No, everyone's struggling with things. Even, even the best family that you see in the church, the one that seems like they've got it all together, look at that mother and her kids, wow, it's so awesome. I guarantee you during the week they're still crying. There's, shit, you know, there's tears, there's frustrations, there's difficulties. Okay? So for you to think, oh man, you know, I've got to copy this other woman, hey, that's, an, that's emulations, that's a work of the flesh. Please use the knowledge, the instinct, the word of God as your guidance when it comes to raising your children. Okay, let me give you a funny story of this. Um, this is in one of my previous churches, a real story. Um, we, don't, we don't toilet train our children until they're about three years old. Now, I don't know if you think that's, that's late or not. You know, I know some mothers do it a lot earlier. The reason we don't do it till they're three is because we don't like the mess. Okay, by the time they're three years old, we think they're kind of mature enough to really, when, when we teach them, they're able to learn quickly. Okay, now kids can learn earlier, don't get me wrong but they're probably going to make a lot of mess, a lot of mistakes, you know, you know, pee their pants and all those kinds of things. So you know, for us to avoid that, we just, well, let's just keep them in nappies for now. And when they're old enough to understand and, and you know, we can teach them quickly, you know, we wait till they're about three years old. Anyway, uh, one day my wife was talking to another woman in a church and they were talking about children and toilet training, all these kinds of things. And um, uh, Jonathan, Jonathan was 18 months old, so he was a year and a half old. So he's obviously not, not at an age that we would toilet train him, okay? But another woman overheard their conversation and somehow concluded that we had toilet trained Jonathan at 18 months. That at 18 months he was already toilet trained. And she panicked because she had a child which is about 18 months old and that child hadn't been toilet trained. And she's like, well, what in the world? You know, this other woman has toilet trained a child at one and a half years, 18 months? I better start toilet training my kids. You know, at, at, at that age. I mean, obviously that wasn't even true, but that's what she overheard. She thought she overheard and she was trying to choose. What, what was she doing? She was emulating. Okay. She said, oh, they're doing it. I must do it. Otherwise, I'm a bad mother or something. Okay. Anyway, um, I remember we, we invited this family to our house and, you know, Jonathan was still in nappies and she got angry at Christina <laughs> and said, hold on. I heard you say that he was toilet trained already. Christina's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> We've never discussed this. She goes, no, you were talking to that woman in church that, you know, he was toilet trained. This whole time, I've been trying to toilet train my kid and it's been a disaster. <laughs> <Okay>? <laughs> Why? Because she's been emulating, all right? Instead of just speaking to her husband and working out, this is my family, this is my situation, this is how I'm going to raise my family, she tried to look at another situation of another family, which wasn't even right, and tried to emulate, try to copy it and bring it into her household. And I understand this, and, and this comes down to husbands. You've got to give your wife encouragement. You know, you've you got to make sure that they understand you're, you're, you're backing them, okay? Because sometimes, you know, women, they can feel insecure. They, Am I doing this right? And they'll look for security from other women. But other women are raising different families. Not the same, okay? So you can't just upload somebody's family schedule and download it into your family. It's not going to work, okay? You take the principles that are laid out for us in the Bible and you apply them to your family the best way you know how. You know, you might put your kids to bed at different times than other families. It doesn't matter. As long as you're doing things in accordance to God's word, make sure you don't emulate other people. And uh, the, the reason I, I bring this up is because, well, actually, can you guys go to, while I talk, go to Ecclesiastes 4. We're almost done now. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Because mothers, you have a, a, an important, important responsibility of raising the next generation of believers. A godly seed. 
That's a huge responsibility. And this world is telling you, you're wasting your life. Get out there and get a career and you know, make a name for yourself. No, no. You can make such a name for yourself just by raising a godly generation, a holy generation. Please don't bypass that. Look at verse number Ecclesiastes 4.4, 4, please. Ecclesiastes 4.4. 4. The Bible says, again, I considered all travail and every right work that for this a man is envied of his neighbor. Look, envy. This is kind of like when you look at someone and go, man, I wish I had that. I wish I was like that. That's envy. Let's keep finishing. It says here, this is also vanity and vexation of spirit. Mothers, look, don't look at another mother and envy what they do. Envy their husbands or envy their children, envy their lifestyle. The Bible tells us this is also vanity and vexation of spirit. And again, I've seen this in churches because there's a lot of pressure on, on mothers, right? A lot of pressure, you know, and, and, and they, they envy other people and then it brings them vexation in their souls. And what happens here is that families will put down other families or mothers will put down other mothers. And it's such a wicked, wicked thing. Let me give you an example of what I mean. You know, when, 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 when one mother goes to another mother, and says, oh, you know, how old is your child? Oh, he's, he's not walking yet? You know, my, oh, my child walked when he was only, you know, 10 months old. All right? What are they doing? What are they doing? They're trying to put down the other mother. They're trying to put down that other family, aren't they? Say, so, well, well and, and they're trying to bring issues and problems that that person probably didn't even have. And now they're worried. Well, hold on. Maybe my kids, uh, do I got to take my kids to the specialist? I got to take him. Why isn't he walking by now? Look, children develop at different stages. And, and I, used to, I used to just to get so frustrated, you know. You know, our mothers would come up and sometimes our kids would be advanced, some of them. Sometimes they'd be slower. Who cares? I know they're going to walk eventually. I know they're going to talk eventually. Okay? And they're going to do these things. Who cares if they're two months ahead of another child? Who cares? Okay, but th mothers, this is what they do sometimes. This is what ladies do. They, they challenge one another, but it's kind of like these, these harsh words be behind the scenes, kind of like, you know, or, or they'll, you know, put down other children, you know, oh, you, how's your child two years old? Oh, you know, m when my child was, you know, one, he was taller than him or something like that. You know, always competing, always comparing. Don't worry, don't get into that, please. Don't, look, if, if, if someone does that to you, you know, what that means is that they've got their own insecurities, okay? In, in order for them to feel better about themselves, they're trying to put down other mothers. And I know this happens in church. I don't want this to happen in this church, okay? I don't want this to happen in this church where mothers are comparing one another. No, please, don't envy one another. Don't become envious of other mothers. It's so important. You know, I, I, I learned this in church, okay? And then I had to go, does the Bible talk about it? Oh, yeah, it does talk about this stuff, right? Emulations, envy, these kinds of things we need to be careful of. So in conclusion for mothers, I hope I've given you some things to think about. In conclusion, number one, children are a reward from God. Please find joy in them, okay? You've been given a massive responsibility. Number two, your husband has entrusted you with those children, Okay, they want to be able to get to work and focus on that, focus on providing so they don't have to worry about the issues at home. Please take responsibility for that. Number three, you are a mother first of all. No, not a friend first of all. You are a mother first of all. Find the authority. Put your foot down with your children. Don't let them uh, run you ragged. And number four, don't envy other mothers and other families. That's right.